What an amazing worship experience. I mean, God has so highly honored us by adding such a tremendous team of musicians and singers to our ministry that uh, I, I really appreciate them. And so let's give them a round of applause for what they do. Are you ready for the word? Well, I'm ready to teach, and so I like to pray before I teach. So would you bow your heart with me, please? Father, thank you so much for the beauty of your word. As I teach today, let it not just be another sermon. Let it be a life-transforming moment that we experience together in your presence. In Christ's name, amen. I want to talk with you about a topic I title, Building Character. This is the third and final sermon in the series, Character and Integrity. In fact, if you missed week one, where I talked about character matters, and week two, shaping character, I have these sermons up on YouTube. Please visit them and let the ministry of the Word transform your life. Character is so, so important. We always struggle, though, well, what exactly does character mean? Well, the great American evangelist D.L. Moody once said, Character is what you are in the dark. In other words, nobody's watching. Nobody's looking. You are, as if it were, hidden from everyone's attention. How will you function? Character is something that you can't will for your character to become godly. You can't muscle your way through it, but you must be intentional and you must be able to focus on you have a responsibility. And I want to then walk you through in a very practical way what it means to build your character. But let's start off with this premise. Every one of us has character flaws. That's normal. That's normative. That's to be expected. Don't beat yourself up just because you saw an area of your character that still needs to be honed. Every one of us has areas that still need to be honed and developed and shaped so we can be able to then be like our Heavenly Father in terms of our character. May I begin, though, by asking you, what are three building blocks to building character? First, I give you this, and that is value your name. Your name, it's akin to your signature. It's your resume. It's your calling card. Your name, I'm not just talking about if your name Fred or your name is Mary or it's Hazel or Jessica or David. That's not what I'm referring to. I'm talking about what Solomon says in Proverbs 22.1. He says, a good name earned by honorable behavior, godly wisdom, moral courage, and personal integrity is more desirable than great riches, and favor is better than silver and gold. Solomon is counseling us that you need to value your name. In other words, labor to have a good name and value it. And when you value that, he says, when you give it great thought, a good name, it's worth more than great riches. You know how many people that are wealthy, millionaires, billionaires, but they may not have a good name? And they would do almost anything to have a good name. And when you think about good name, I love the Amplified. It drops down. It's talking about it's having moral courage. It's having godly wisdom. I'm not talking about wisdoms where you can just solve problems. I'm talking about wisdom where you can solve problems and maintain godliness and integrity. That's what it means to have a good name. Think about the whole idea of moral courage. Where would Moses have been if he took a pole of Egypt before leading the children of Israel out to the promised land? Where would Jesus be if he took a poll of Israel to get a common consensus as to the word ministry he should exemplify and use in Israel? 
Where would Martin Luther, the great German reformer, be if he took a poll of his world and his day in order to be able to say that the just shall live by faith? What I'm saying is that moral courage may not be a party line word, and moral courage may not be something that you just, just go along with the group. Moral courage, when you say, I have a good name and I'm going to make sure that I'm going to honor that and I'm going to do it in a courageous way. I remember, it was years ago, this young man in our church, he was struggling to get into college and his mom came to me. He was struggling in his character too. And I said, I'm going to write a letter and I'm going to get you into college. But here's what I want you to do. Don't ruin my name. You're getting in, not by your grades, you're getting in because I'm writing this particular letter of recommendation. I know the powers that be, the president of the university, I'm going to get you in. I wrote the note, he got in. It was less than a month that he got expelled. Why? Character. I said to him, I told you not to bring harm to my name. Now, thankfully, my character was strong enough that his indiscretion and his behavior didn't harm my name. But the point is that I have to value my name. You have to value your name. And I ask you that question because you may say, what's in the name? If you want to build your character, it starts off there. Value your name. Let me tell you what Paul says about one of the young men that he highly esteemed and he called him by name. In Philippians 2 verse 19, Paul says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon. I will be happy to learn how you are. I have no one else like Timothy who truly cares for you. Other people are interested only in their own lives, not in the work of Jesus Christ. You know the kind of person Timothy is. You know he has served with me in telling the good news as a son serves his father. I plan to send him to you quickly when I know what will happen to me. Think about it. Paul was writing this letter to the church at Philippi from behind prison bars. And he says, I can't come to you, but what I will do, I don't want, you're not going to be disappointed because I'm sending to you Timothy. You know who he is. And then Paul pulls back the curtain as if it were to say, let me tell you about the real Timothy because you may know him from, from the platform, from the stage, from being a speaker. But let me tell you, I know Timothy behind the scenes and behind the scenes, he's the same as what you see in front of the stage as he is behind the stage. Timothy, he's a godly man and he's, he's served with me like a, like a son serves his father. And, let me, and, he's, and Paul starts to brag about him. Has everybody ever bragged about you? Has anybody ever said, man, do you know so-and-so? And they just started to just lavish your reputation and your character, all of that behind your name. And when those individuals met you, they had not a false reading or a false interpretation. They valued your name. Let me ask you this question. Do you value your name? If you do then you need to recognize it's a building block to godly character. Let's continue as we're looking at this. I love what Charles Spurgeon, one of my favorite historical preachers, a British preacher, Spurgeon said, a good character is the best tombstone. Those who love you and were helped by you will remember you when forget-me-nots, name of flowers, when forget-me-nots have withered. Carve your name on hearts, not on marble. We're talking about building character. And if you're going to build character, the first building block I offer you to use is value your name. Let's go back again. How can I build my character is my question. My second building block is keep your word. Character building is about answering the question, what do I admire most about the people in my life that have godly character? And oftentimes, what I may admire 
is the fact that they value and honor their word. They keep their word. Jesus did that. And if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, follow him even to this aspect of his character. Matthew 24, verse 35, Jesus says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Jesus is telling us that he he keeps his word. He honors his word. He places great value and importance on his word. So much so that his word is like a calling card. His word is an extension of his person. When you want to know about Jesus' character, look at his words. His words, it's like a resume, a CV. And I want you to recognize that. Many years ago, during the formative days of Christ's church, And the church started, I was 24 years old. I think I was on a speaking engagement. I may have been 28 years old. I'm speaking upstate New York. And the pastor there was also in the same circumstances I was. That means we're pastoring, both of us, a tiny church. His church may have been about 100. Mine may have been about the same. And so, and I remember him telling me what helped to shape him in his character as a young pastor. He said, David, I went to this pastor's conference And one of the famous pastors in the body of Christ in America at that time, pastoring a megachurch, when back in the 80s, (laughs) megachurches were far and few in between. Now they're more normative. Back then it was rare. He's pastoring a church, three, 4,000 people. Brother Dick was his name. And he saw him at this conference, and there are thousands of leaders that are there from all over the country to convene, and somehow as they're walking through the lobby area, they saw each other. And my friend said to this famous pastor, pastor uh, he said, Brother Dick, he said, how are you? He said, man, I'm doing good. It's been a long time since I've seen you. He says, John, you and I, let's have lunch together today. And John was so enamored, he wants to have lunch with me. John said, yes. As soon as John was walking away, This famous television evangelist, very popular at the height of his career back then, walked through the lobby. He saw Brother Dick. He said, Brother Dick, how are you? And Brother Dick said, good to see you, man. They knew each other. And the famous evangelist said to Brother Dick, hey, Brother Dick, it's been a long time since we've caught up. Let's have lunch together. My friend, which was in earshot, he was waiting for Brother Brother Dick to say sure and then cancel his appointment with him. And Brother Dick said to the famous evangelist, He said, oh, I'm sorry. I already have an appointment. And so I'm sorry. We'll have to do it another time. My friend walked away with nothing but admiration for this other pastor that had modeled before him godly character. How so? Because he kept his word. I want you to understand the value of what it means to keep your word. And so Jesus tells us in Matthew 5 verse 7, he says, But let your yes mean yes, and no mean no. For whatever is more than these comes from the evil one. What Jesus was saying is this, that when you give your word, honor your word. And he's saying if you say yes, follow through. If you say no, follow through with that. Now, he's not suggesting you can't change your mind. He's just saying that when you do change your mind, be integrous about it. Go back to the person. Give a reason and be as supportive as possible to make as many adjustments as you need to so you can be able to honor your previous statement as best as possible if it's in your power to do so. What Jesus was saying, in essence, is this. Not just your, how you go about changing your mind once you've given your word. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is that you need to know and give some thought before you give an answer to a request of you. And you need to be honest with people. And don't just glibly and quickly and give a quick response and just, well, okay, yes, and you really didn't mean it. And don't just go and say no just because you really didn't mean it. He's saying give some thought to what you're going to say because your word should be honored by you. And when your word does not align with your character then you have to then start adjusting your word and you'll find that your character will follow suit. And it's all connected because you must value your word. And your word, it's again like a calling card. It's your resume. It speaks of who you are. Now, none of us are perfect, but every one of us uses words. 
And what we try to do then is to make sure that we not only value and honor our word, but we keep our word. And we make sure that our words reflect honesty. Sometimes we glibly respond to people and we say it because we speak prematurely or we're afraid of their response or we're afraid to be honest. I had this counseling appointment, couple, married couple. The husband and the wife, as soon as they sat down in my office, I didn't even get a chance to go through some niceties. How are you guys? The husband just jumped right in. I'm talking about right into the middle of stuff. He said, Pastor, my wife is a liar. And you can see, I mean, from my experience, you can see that he's saying that to really embarrass her in front of me. And I can just detect from my experience and the Holy Spirit just dealing with us in that session. I said, she's not a liar. She's just afraid of you. Are there people in your life that can't tell you the truth? And you may want to just simply categorize them as being a liar. Is that really the issue? Or is the issue that you're too harsh? You're too authoritative? The repercussions are grave. So people don't feel safe to be honest. I'm not condoning lying. We ought to always be honest. But sometimes people are not being honest because they're afraid and not because of the fact that they're just people that just want to be dishonest. Change your ways, like I told that husband. Stop being so harsh with your wife and you'll find that her honesty will be so clear and she'll keep her words with you because she's no longer afraid of you. I want us to understand that God, who is our Heavenly Father, He becomes our example to how we should keep our word. Psalm 89 verse verse 34 says, I won't break my agreement or go back on my word. That's God speaking through the psalmist. He's saying, here's how I roll. When I say yes, I mean yes. When I say no, I mean no. And so we then try to emulate and imitate and mirror our Heavenly Father and how He carries Himself. And here's what Jesus said on this same note in Matthew 12, verse 36. Our Lord says, But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you'll be acquitted, and by your words you'll be condemned. That's pretty heavy. What Jesus was telling us is this. Keep your word, because your words create life. When you give your word, it creates expectation. It creates a sense of promise. People can bank on it, or they should be able to. And so when you find that your word, you can't keep it, then you need to then begin to change that so that the reputation, the word on the street about you is not that you don't keep your word. Change your character by keeping your word and you'll find your character begins to go through this metamorphosis so you become godlier and godlier. Each day you become more and more like Jesus. And how does this start? In a very practical way, not only by valuing your name, by keeping your word. Let me ask you this question. If I ask your family and friends, do you keep your word? What would your family and friends say? What what would they say about that if I said, do you keep your word? If they say no, don't be angry. Make a shift. If they say yes, be excited and continue keeping your word. Let's continue this teaching. I'm talking about building character. And so I ask the question, how can I build my character? I've given you two building blocks already. Building block number one is that you value your name. Building block number two, you keep your word. Now I offer you a third building block to building character. How can I build my character? Guard your heart. See, your heart, is, it's the birthplace of character. 
It's the soil where character grows and develops. It's that nutritious soil where godly character should be able to get all the nutrients necessary to grow. No matter what the environment is externally, you can still grow godly in a broken and corrupt world. Proverbs 11 verse 3 says, The integrity of the upright guides them, but the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. See, what Solomon was telling us is that your heart, that's the home of your integrity. That's the foundation of your character. When you guard your heart, I'm not talking about the biological heart. I'm talking about the the soul, the inner core of who you are, the essence of who you are as a man, the essence of who you are as a woman, as a young person. Guard your heart because when you don't guard your heart, it gets all filled up with junk and tainted and duplicitous. And you can feel the duplicity. And you can just sense the insincerity that comes out of people. And that's a very dangerous thing. And so I said, guard your heart. And Solomon is telling us, because that's the seat of integrity. I remember this gentleman, he worked at a financial firm. And his boss kept saying to him, look, I need you to, to, you know, to change the numbers and to you know, you know, well, no, it's not a lie. We're just giving another perspective. And he'd use these kinds of euphemisms. And it was really lying, blatant lying. And my friend said, no. Shortly thereafter, the boss terminated him. He's sitting at home sulking. And less than a month, the SEC brings charges against the firm. And many of my friend's colleagues were thrown in prison. Why? Because they had succumbed to the boss's intent to lie, and they were complicit in their shenanigans, and as a result, prison sentence hits them. I want you to see what, it's me- what it means to guard your heart. Let me go back with you now to Matthew 12 and watch the words of Jesus when he says, A tree is identified by its fruit. If a tree is good, its fruit will be good. If a tree is bad, its fruit will be bad. You brood of snakes, how could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. Jesus made it very plain to us. Our heart, it's the soil of godly character. If you don't guard your heart, all kinds of things will come in. Bitterness, anger, hatred, duplicity. And when people ask you questions, you tell them what you think they want to hear, and you're not honest. And when you say that over time, or initially it may, may, you may get away with it, you may not see anything there, but over time what you're doing is building a duplicitous character, one that lacks integrity, and your life is no longer integrated where your actions fit your attitudes, which fits your character. It's out of alignment, and it starts because you didn't guard your heart. I want you to see that your heart is so precious that you must guard it. It's the wellspring of your integrity. And I always want to guard my heart that my heart doesn't become junked up where I become someone that knows how to say the right thing but don't feel what I say or don't say what I feel. I want to have alignment in the interior part of my life. And when you think about building character, it's not some elusive thing that will happen in the by and by or because you hope it will happen or you will for it to happen. It's going to require you intentionally using these building blocks where you value your name, where you keep your word and you guard your heart. And when you do that, you'll find integrity and godly character begin to blossom out of your heart. And when people look at you, they're going to inspect and taste the fruit from your life. And when they taste it, it won't be sour. The fruit will be sweet. Why? Because a godly character produces good fruit, 
which is the fruit is not for you. The fruit is for others that are in your life, on your job, in your home, in your church, in your community, in your sphere of influence. They'll eat from your life and they'll say, when I get around that individual, I feel good about myself because they're such a great example to me of someone who has a morally upright character, a godly character. One of those men that I always admired, read his autobiography, read a number of his books, was the late Billy Graham. Not because he was this great preacher, but because he was such a godly man in his character. And here's what Billy Graham said on this very topic. Integrity is the glue that holds our way of life together. We must constantly strive to keep our integrity intact. When wealth is lost, nothing is lost. When health is lost, something is lost. When character is lost, all is lost. And so I want to encourage you, let nothing cause you to lose your character. Guard your heart because it's the home where character is developed. May I pray with you today? Thank you for being a part of these three sermons on character and integrity. Would you bow your heart with me, please? I will pray two prayers. The first is for you who have never before invited Jesus Christ to become your Savior. He died for your sins, and He'd love to be your Savior and the Lord of your life. And you may say, well, how do I make Jesus my Savior? You invite Him into your life. I'm going to pray, but I ask that you repeat after me these simple words of prayer. The prayer is your invitation of Jesus to come and live within you and make your life his home. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I invite you into my heart today. Wash away my sins. And Jesus, be my Savior and be my Lord. I ask you this in your very name. Amen. Congratulations. We have prepared some resources just to help you on this spiritual journey that you just began when you prayed with me. Follow the promptings on the screen and it'll give you access where you can be able to now understand in a fuller way what does it mean to have prayed with Pastor David and how do I, excuse me, how do I grow in this relationship? And so we've prepared for you resources that'll be right where you are. And for you who have been part of this three-week journey on character, may I pray with you? Father, I thank you that each person would continue to grow in their character. That year 2021 will be the most significant character building year ever that they experience with your help. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you. Have a great week.